All right, good to see you today. Uh, whether you're watching this in the morning with us or whether you're checking, checking uh, this worship time out later on in the week, as always, we're glad you're here. I'm honored to worship with you and to come to God's Word. I want to tell you right now, welcome to week number five of our series, Rebuilt. Again, we've been in this, uh, in this series looking at the book of Nehemiah to discover how God works in our lives to rebuild and restore things. And uh, it's, it's starting to get good. We're getting to the meat of this, uh, of this book. And so I want to invite you, grab your Bibles, uh, grab your, your paper copies or your digital ones, whichever you have and prefer. Uh, and we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 15, uh, all the way into uh, chapter 7, verse 3 is where we're going to, where we're going to cut off today. And so I actually want to start by reading the scripture. I want to hold up God's word uh, very as primary today. And so if you would go ahead and grab that, uh, I want to, I want to invite you to do so. And uh, of course we're going to put the verses on the screen for you. If you don't have a Bible, that's all right. And as always, if you don't have one, uh, let us know. We would love to give you a Bible. We want to give you we want to give you that as a gift today. So reach out to us on our website. Uh, you can just fill out a, a connection card and let us know, hey, I need a Bible, or you can email me, Troy, Troy at the point pgh.org. Either way, we'd love to, to bless you with that. So we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 6. And so this is uh, the reading of God's Word today. It says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul, in 52 days. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized uh, that this work had been done with the help of our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. From, uh, for many in Judah were under oath to him since he was son-in-law to Shechaniah son of Arah and his son Jehohanan. Uh, you, you wouldn't know either way, right? Had married the daughter of Meshulam, uh, son of Berechiah. Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and then telling him what I said. And Tobias sent letters to intimidate me. So he has some good relationships with some people, but uh, Tobiah continues to want to try to intimidate Nehemiah here. Uh, so it picks up in chapter 7. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and the singers and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most men do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened till the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their, their own house. So that's God's word to us, uh, even if the Hebrew names were butchered by the pastor. <laughs> May God bless it. Let me pray for us. Uh, Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for your spirit that calms our hearts, that speaks to us in these continually challenging, difficult times. I pray that you would, as always, speak to, the, uh, speak to your people, uh, whether we're in living rooms right now, whether we're watching this online later on in the week. God, we need to hear from you. Thank you, uh, God, that you would speak through me, speak in me today, do the work in me that you want to uh, declare through me. God, I, I, I need you today. I need you to speak this message to your people in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. As always in the, in the chat, if you're watching with us live online uh, or, you know, maybe in the living room, wherever you might be in our live group, our launch team right now. Uh, amen. Uh, simple Hebrew word, by the way. I don't know if you knew this. Amen just means, yeah, I agree with that. Let that be so. That's all you're saying when you say amen. Uh, I know that's one of those words people finish up grace, you know, at a meal and go, hey, amen. I don't even know what I'm saying, but that's all it means. It says, yes, I agree. Let it be so. So uh, Nehemiah chapter six. So we've come a long way in this book. 
right? Uh, Nehemiah at the beginning was a worker in the king's palace. He was the cupbearer, and he heard bad news of how Jerusalem had been destroyed 140 years beforehand, heard the state of the walls and, and the people, how disheartened they were, generations having grown up surrounded by destruction, and Nehemiah sensed in his heart that God was calling him to do something about it. He may not have had it on his resume. He may not have been the right engineer or architect for the project, but he was available to God. He said, I am willing to go if you'll send me. And so he goes before the king and he tells him what's on his mind. And the king gives him a blessing to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So he gets to Jerusalem, and after checking things out, he gets everybody on board, and they start the project of rebuilding the walls in Jerusalem. And of course, along the way, they're met with opposition. There's challenges that they have to overcome. There's haters that are speaking insults from the outside, questioning and doubting the work they were doing. But Nehemiah the whole time was sure of the calling of God on his life and the promises that God had made to him and to his people. And so he kept going. And he kept pushing back. And we looked at some of that last week, right? And in this whole series, we're asking ourselves the question, what does God want to rebuild in my life? What in the middle of COVID, in the middle of a political season, what does God want to rebuild in me and through me right now? What promises are God is God making to me that he wants to fulfill? What what areas of brokenness and hardship does he want to restore and heal and forgive? How, how does God want to call his people back? And so that's what we've been looking at. And now here we are. We, we come to one of the climactic moments in the book of Nehemiah. That, that after all this work has been done, Nehemiah tells us that the wall has been rebuilt. Uh, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I have learned a lot over the last five months or so about myself. I've learned a lot about how other people operate. I've, I've learned a lot uh, about the struggles that I have internally and, and a lot about society in general. Uh, Melody and I this week were reflecting a little bit on what we've learned and she said something that was so fascinating to me. She said, Troy, I realized as I was scrolling through Facebook the other day, she said, I, I remember as a kid you know, and, and even as we've gotten older, you, you go to the grocery store and you, you go to the checkout line and at the end of the checkout line, you see that whole, uh, that whole wall there or that display of magazines, right? Headlines and, and you see all the latest gossip and you see tabloids, like crazy sensationalized over the top things that are printed just to get you to buy them, just for entertainment's sake, right? I, I remember as a kid seeing one with the headline, something like, you know, ex-celebrity actually found out to be a vampire. Or, or you know, the earth swallowed California whole. And uh, it's uh, crazy over-the-top stories. Headlines, right? Tabloids, things that are there to get us to buy it, for entertainment's sake. And she said, she said, Troy, I've realized as I scroll through my feed that I am being, I'm being uh, reprogrammed to read everything like it's a tabloid, right? So I'm being conditioned to question everything that I see. Someone posts an article and immediately my thought is, how true is that? Is that real? Uh, what what sources is that coming from? Wh who's like who's paying to have this thing printed, right? And what are the political biases involved and in the, the alternative agendas and and reasoning that people are are printing these things? What what is real? What is true? What can I believe? And what do I need to fact check? And we're consumed with that right now, aren't we? And so many of us are so quick to post and to comment and, and to share things, especially online, that the headline looks great because it lines up with our own uh, presuppositions and our biases. And so we just immediately post something without questioning for a second if there's even a bias and an alter ulterior motive on that side. We just post, we share, and immediately when we see something we disagree with, all we start pointing out, oh, there's no way that's real. There's no way that I can trust that. 
We are in an age where the tabloid has gone digital and we are conditioned to question everything. Even well-meaning and well-respected sources now are under scrutiny. We live in this day and age of questioning and distrusting everything we see. And as I'm reading through the book of Nehemiah, and especially just the the scriptures in general, I can't help but feel like maybe we bring some of that skepticism to the table when we read the Bible. The Bible is, uh, is really a book full of headlines, some pretty crazy claims, some things that are, that are out there when you think about it. I mean, this is a book that, that talks about a worldwide flood. It, it's a book that, that talks about seas being parted. It's a book that talks about the dead being raised to life, blind people seeing with just a word. There's some, there's some crazy stuff. I mean, a, a guy was literally swallowed by a giant fish and then three days later spat out. These are headline-worthy things, right? If you were to take the Bible, uh, kind of what you understand and your preconceived notions of it off the table for a minute, and you just typed some of this stuff on your Facebook feed, people might call you crazy. Uh, partly, that's why we call it faith. Not, not necessarily because it's crazy, but because it's something that at first glance, you, you might not believe it's real. And I believe today in our passage, you read one of those. You read one of those. Like, like people might tell you if you're looking at a tabloid and you can't believe the headlines. But I want to I tell you today as we come to Nehemiah, and if you want to type this in the chat as always or tell the person next to you, uh, believe the headlines. When it comes to the scriptures and when it comes to the work of God, believe the headlines. Because watch what happens. I read it just a moment ago. It says in verse 15, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. That's a a headline. That seemed crazy to me. When I first read that, I stopped and I said, Okay, really? We're talking about Amateur builders, we're talking about, there's no engineer, there's really no expert here. There's not like giant cranes and bulldozers, you know, like the stuff that my boys love right now as as little kids, they just love construction uh, machines. There's none of that. This is a crew of people in the city hauling stones and logs and and building and restoring a wall around a, a city. And the Bible tells us, according to Nehemiah, that this was finished in 52 days. It was completed on the 25th day of Elul. And that's an important date. We're actually going to come back to that next week. Uh, But that's basically, uh, Elul is pretty much the end of the Jewish calendar year. Okay, so this is, for them, this is actually harvest time. This is the end of the summer. This is right now here in Pittsburgh. It's August, the end of August. This is Elul, August into September for the Jewish calendar. So this is happening pretty much right now. At the end of this, at the end of this year, the wall gets completed in 52 days. And you read that and you think that's crazy. That's, that's insane. But I was studying this week and I found out that According to archaeologists and studies in Jerusalem from this time period, there is ample evidence to say that this construction project was done very, very quickly. Now, some of that might be that the the workmanship might not have been what it would have been if it would have taken longer. So maybe it happened quickly and the the result shows that. But ultimately, archaeologists and scholars say that this reconstruction project that happened happened very quickly. Now they can't put a date on it, but here Nehemiah is saying 52 days. So at the very least, we're saying two months to rebuild a wall. Now, why am I going on and on about this construction project and the length of time? Because I really believe that we suffer, especially in the American church, of just average faith. Right? We we look at things like this and we read the stories in the scriptures and we think that's great. Maybe that happened, but I mean, can it really happen like that today? Because there aren't really construction projects going on in your life. Maybe you're not building a house. Maybe you are, but maybe you're not expecting God's hand to build your new home or 
Um, uh, we would love to see God's hand at work rebuilding the roads in Pittsburgh. Come on, amen, somebody, right? If only it could take 52 days to redo 51 or 376 or some of your back roads. But the truth is we, we don't expect God to move miraculously like this. Nehemiah says the hand of our God was on us. With the help of our God, we built this thing in 52 days. And if we're honest right now in the American church, we just do not expect that. And some of that, I think, is because we live a comfortable faith. Let's be honest for a moment. We've been in, in quarantine or under restrictions now for five months here in this country. And it's been difficult and it's been challenging. And even for us as a young church plant, we've had to rethink how to do things and how to reach people, how to be the church. But we look in other parts of the world and the truth is there are countries where Christianity is completely outlawed, where you have to be underground, where people are being thrown in jail, where especially in parts of Africa right now, there are whole communities of Christians being wiped out because they claim the name of Jesus. And here we are. And the worst thing that's happening to us is that we have to sit on our couches and watch worship on a TV and we feel like we're persecuted. Can I preach for a moment? We don't need God to move in these miraculous ways. Because we have our building programs, and we have our fundraising, and we have our strategies to reach people. And, and the fact is, even if we're not talking about the institutional church, we as American Christians are comfortable we're not reaching out necessarily to our unreached friends. We're not, we're not stepping out in faith to put our neck on the line. We don't have to worry about persecution. I know California is not allowing people to sing, but no one's saying they can't actually go to church. They're saying just try to keep it minimal. And we could have that discussion for a different time. I understand the, the fear behind that. But at the end of the day, what I'm saying is this. And this isn't really even in my notes. I just sense God's spirit telling me right now to say this into the camera. That we don't expect God, as Chris read earlier, to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine because we don't need him to. Because for the longest time we've been comfortable and we've been able to just go about our faith as a Sunday morning thing that we check the box and we move on, and Monday we wake up and we go about our jobs, and we end up, and we don't mean to, I'm not trying to yell at anybody, because I do this too, but we put God in a box and we say, this is Him on a Sunday, and I'm going to reach in and I'll take Jesus out, and then I'll put Him back in, and then when I need Him later on in the week, I'll pull Him out and I'll dust Him off, and then, and then we'll go about our business. But the fact is, Nehemiah and these people in Jerusalem were desperate for a move of God. If they were going to build this wall in the, in the quick amount of time that was needed to keep them protected from their enemies, to honor the wishes of the king, and to reestablish themselves as a city, to regain uh, the, the, from the dishonor and the, the anxiety that they've been feeling, the hopelessness that they've been feeling, they needed to see God move. They needed Him to do something. And I want wonder if we're not desperate today, if we're not desperate for a move of God. We say we are, we pray for it, but do we live our lives in such a way that God has to step in? That God has to step in? Because I believe today that we can trust the headlines about who God is. We can trust what God says about Himself in the Scriptures. That this same God who delivered the people and rebuilt the walls in 52 days through them is the same God who works miracles today. He's still moving. He's still active. He's still saving people. God is still a redeemer. He's still a healer. He's still a savior. He's still powerful. He is still more than enough. He's our provider. He is the same God today that he was 2,500 years ago in Jerusalem when they built this wall. Do you believe it? Do you believe today that he's the same, that he is consistent? God is the one who's at work. God is the one who's at work. And I want to declare to you today, that when God's at work, God finishes what He starts. God finishes what He starts. 
In Philippians chapter 1, verses 4 to 6, the Apostle Paul beautifully writes this to the, to the church in Philippi. He says, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And he says, Being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you is faithful to see it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Paul says, God is the one, whatever revival you're praying for, whatever re restoration and healing, whatever addictions you're praying to see broken in your life, whatever provision you need, and ultimately whatever holiness God wants to work in you, He is faithful that He's the one doing the work. He's the one who is getting this thing going. Before that, I mean, he says that, that now we work out our salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in us to will and to act according to His good purpose. God's the one doing the work. And God always finishes what He starts. So maybe today you feel like, man, I haven't made any progress. I'm struggling with the same things that I've been struggling with for years. I can't seem to get over these hang-ups. I want to tell you today, God is faithful. God began the good work in you. God wants to begin a good work in you. And He is faithful to complete it. And I, I love what happens here in Nehemiah. It says that when people see in the surrounding villages and nations that this wall had been built as quickly as it had been, it says the enemies lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. You know what you have to look forward to? If you're frustrated right now during COVID, if you're frustrated uh, you know, personally with yourself or with the state of things around you, what you have to look forward to is that when God begins to complete the work in you, the enemy is going to lose self-confidence. There's going to come a point where the enemy just has to fall back because he knows God is at work. You're going to get attack. You're going to get opposition. But as you trust God and he works victories in your life and you start to see sin overcome and you start to live a holy life and you see your friends and family coming to faith because of you, the enemy is going to lose confidence. And more importantly, you're going to gain confidence in God. Because you will trust, your faith is going to grow, that He is faithful to finish the work that He began. You see, when God works in our lives, the enemy flees. The enemy flees from us as we run to God and allow Him to work in us. There's, there's a portion of this text here at the end that I really want to highlight. If we're going to see God work in these miraculous, powerful ways... If we're going to believe again that we need God, if we're going to see our family members come to faith in Jesus, if we're going to see injustice brought down in the name of Jesus, the, the power of the kingdom of God come through the church, there's, some, there's something we need to do. And, and this is something that's been a theme throughout Nehemiah that I really want to highlight here at the end of this message. And it's very simple. So, we picked up with seven, uh, chapter 7, verse 1 to 3. He said, After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers and singers and Levites were appointed. He says, I put in charge my brother. He was a godly man. I'm going to skip down to verse 3. I said to them, to the leaders, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. Also, hear this, appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. See, during this rebuilding work that God is calling us to be a part of, we need to remember this, that not only does God finish what He starts, but He appoints His people. God appoints His people. In this text, the wall is finished, the gates are, are now in place, and Nehemiah, by the wisdom of God, appoints leaders and guards around the city. It's fascinating to me that some of them are Levites and singers. These are the worship leaders of the Old Testament people. 
Uh, these, are the, these are the singers, these are the, the pastors, the priests, the worship leaders, and they actually get appointed as people to oversee the wall's guarding and protection. This is God reclaiming his city, not just the temple that had been rebuilt, but the whole city belongs to God. It's all an act of worship. But did you catch the, the note at the end? He said, also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. God wants to appoint people to the work of guarding his house and guarding his city. And he doesn't pick the most worthy. He doesn't pick people with the greatest resume. He picks everyday people. And that's how this project has been finished in 50 do, 52 days anyway. That God didn't always use the strongest. God didn't always use the smartest. God used the people who were there. God used the people and he gave them ownership of building the walls and now guarding them. And I believe today that God's word for us is as we, as we look at the headlines, as we look at the miraculous ways that God works and moves in the scriptures and in our lives today, we need to remember that he does it through us, that God appoints us where we are. God selects this guy, Joe, over here to guard the wall next to his house. Because he knows there's investment there. Because that's where Joe, I'm just using a random name, Joe has been planted. And Joe's invested in that community. And I wonder today, if as we, as we watch online, as we worship together, I wonder if God has appointed you right where you are. I wonder if God has you in the community that he has you, next to the neighbors that he has you. I, I know they may drive you nuts, but I wonder if they are your assignment. I wonder if your school district is your assignment. If wherever you are is right where God wants you to be. Just like these residents in Jerusalem were called to watch over their part of the city. I believe that followers of Jesus have been appointed and anointed and called right where we are to protect and guard our communities. So here's my challenge for us. Can we believe that God wants to move miraculously right where we are? Can we believe this week that God wants to use us and speak through us to bring healing and restoration and reconciliation through us? What if we stood our ground this week and we prayed? We didn't beat people over the head on Facebook. We prayed for people. My challenge for us this week is to walk our neighborhood and pray for God to move. Pray over every home. Pray over every family. Even every animal that's out barking at you. Because I know we have dogs right along our, uh, our street here. What if I prayed for every family? Every single family. What if I prayed for their dogs? What if I prayed for their work? What if I prayed for the school district? That we want to be for the communities that we're in because God put us here. Because it's my assignment. It is my calling to serve right where I am. God appoints His people. That's how this work got done in 52 days. Because all of these people were empowered to do the work. And as a pastor, I want to declare to you today that you are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work that God has called you to do right where you are. You don't have to wait till you have a degree. You don't have to wait until you have a position in a church. You don't have to wait for any of that. God has by his spirit appointed you right where you are. So what if you made a list this week of 10 names? 10 individuals, 10 family members, 10 friends who know, who you know need the power of God in, in your life, in, in their life through you. What if you wrote those names down and you prayed for them every day as you're walking your community and you're praying for your friends and your family? And when God starts giving you opportunities to bless people, to reach out, to give, to, to give back, to open a door for somebody, Whatever it might look like, I don't know what it's going to look like, but, but what would it look like 
if we made ourselves available to the work that God has for us right where we are. We're getting ready to, to kick off uh, new groups and ministries in the fall to launch kind of in a, in a different way here in, in 2020. And it's my prayer that leading up to that date in, no, in September, we as a church, we as a network of relationships would see ourselves as empowered. That this is your church. This is your ministry. That revival is going to come to your community through you. That revival is going to come in, into Pittsburgh through the churches that are networking and working and praying together to see God's kingdom come. That you are a part of what God is doing here. You aren't just along for the ride. You're not just watching on the bench that you are in the game. You are praying. You are serving. You are responsible to protect and pray over and serve your community. Like I said, I don't have a, a process. I don't have a 10-step program to figure out how to do that best for you. All I know is that if you pray and you leave yourself open like Nehemiah was, God's going to use you. God's going to speak. He's going to heal. And He's going to do something incredible in you. So I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray that God would give you uh, inspiration. He would give you vision. And He would give you the power of His Holy Spirit right now to know that you are a minister of the good news of Jesus. That you can do it. That you can believe for God to do the immaculate, the immeasurably more than all you could ask or imagine. You know what I love about that scripture that Chris read earlier? That at the end it says that he is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. The wall was built in 52 days through people. Our, our city, our communities, our school districts, our families can be restored because of God's power at work within us. So I'm going to pray for you and believe that God is going to do something that will blow your mind. And, and when you type it on Facebook, when you celebrate it, you're going to be able to say to somebody, you better believe the headlines because my God is still at work. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your power. I thank you for how you are calling us to get out of our comfort zones. God, we, we need to step out and to be desperate for your Holy Spirit's work. We need to be desperate to see you do the miraculous. God, I pray that you would empower my brothers and sisters watching this right now to pray for their communities, pray for their neighborhoods, pray for the animals in their lives who are barking for food, even as we pray now. Pray, God, to believe that you're going to rebuild and bring revival to our communities and may it happen through us this week. God, I thank you for the ways we see you at work in the scriptures that might blow our minds today, but God, are, are true and are real and there's evidence for it. May we cling to your promises today. Holy Spirit, pour out on everybody watching this now that they would be ministers of the good news of Jesus wherever they are. We pray it now in his name and everybody said, amen. Amen.